My dearly beloved in Christ, the Savior of the world was to be born in Bethlehem. Centuries before the birth of the Redeemer, it had been foretold by the prophet Micheas that Jesus was to be born in Bethlehem, the city of King David. Choosing to suffer from the very beginning, he would not be born among the comfort of friends and relatives. The demand of the Roman Empire for all adult Jewish males to return to the place of their tribe's birth in order to provide an accurate tax headcount would abruptly change their plans. A long trip would then hence lie between them, a trip which would bring many difficulties. It took about five days for Our Lady and St. Joseph to travel on foot to Bethlehem. The beast of burden was most uncomfortable. The roads were rough and overcrowded. And the weather was harsh with cold, biting winds, rain, and perhaps snow. Finally arriving, they sought shelter and rest. After several days of hard, weary traveling, and on the eve of giving birth to her divine son, Our Lady and St. Joseph found no one, friend or stranger alike, who had offered them refuge. And scripture scholars say they knocked on about 50 doors, and the answer was always the same. There's no room for you. All doors had closed upon them, leaving them with no place to stay and rest. In such a situation, my dearly beloved in Christ, we would have given vent to excessive anger, frustration, and words questioning why God would have allowed this to happen, especially when we were doing what he wanted us to do. However, not a word or thought of complaint came from Our Lady. Our Blessed Mother, as she had always done, lovingly abandoned herself to the desires of God while waiting the manifestation of his divine will. St. Joseph also was a model of patience and submission during that time, which must have pained him immensely since he could not provide shelter for his little family. We have much to learn from both of them since we're so quick to complain and rebel when things do not go well or when unpleasant things happen to us. It was the will of divine providence the Holy Family finally happened upon a miserable cave used as a stable for animals during inclement weather. Father Villar in his book, Marian Meditation, aptly describes the scene. Look at Mary. See her enter that miserable stable. Her delicate sentiments, her maternal love must have been hurt. How repugnant is everything around How could she spend the night in that place? How could she possibly give birth to her son in such a den? Yet Mary is serene and joyful. If this is the will of God, then it's hers also. Enlightened by the Holy Ghost, the Blessed Virgin Mary learns that the moment of Christ's birth is imminent. Although Our Lady is extremely tired from the long, difficult journey She has no desire to rest. Mary prays now more devoutly than ever before. Her ardent desire is to irresistible violence to the heart of God. He lets himself be conquered by Mary's prayer. When she reaches the peak of ecstasy, the Holy Ghost in a miraculous manner acts, and Mary, opening her eyes, finds lying on her mantle more beautiful than the angel's the Son of God, her Son. Mary, virgin before his birth, is also a virgin in his birth. Just as a ray of sunlight passes through a crystal, so also is Christ born. Draw closer confidently and watch the scene. Jesus is about to receive the first adoration, with it the first caresses of his mother. Mary addresses her God living there, really, and physically present. But as a mother, she's entitled to lift that little child and imprint on his delicate cheeks the first kiss. With what ardent love she would kiss him. What a warm embrace. What tender caresses. My dearly beloved in Christ, 
the cold and poverty of that stable is lessened as the eyes of our infant Savior open to rest upon the face of his mother, gazing back at him. So pure, so beautiful, so tender. That glance of Mary is joy and consolation for Jesus. And the glance of Jesus is an increase of grace and sanctity for Mary. With what respect and devotion, at the same time with what tenderness and delicacy, did Mary wrap the little body of her son in poor swaddling clothes? With what profound sorrow did she place him on the rough straw of the manger? The Gospel says that Mary gave birth to her firstborn. Jesus was indeed her firstborn. He is the Son of God and our eldest brother. Then came we who are also children of Mary, who are mystically born at the foot of the cross. What happiness is ours? The mother of God is our mother also. Each of us is a brother or sister of Christ. This is a climax of bounty and love. This is the greatest glory and dignity to which you can aspire. A title that God would not give to his own angels. Mary is indeed the queen of angels, as this church is called. But the angels cannot call her mother as we can. My dearly beloved in Christ, the life of our Lord began with a glance at Mary. And it ended when he looked upon her from the cross. Our lives, too, should be so connected with the Blessed Virgin as we remain under her constant care. To show his love for us, the Son of God came down from heaven to earth in order to suffer and die for our redemption. That suffering began from his very birth in the cold, dark cave. Even though Jesus knew that after his death upon the cross, people would still continue to sin, he nevertheless was willing to endure all from birth to death for those who would believe in him and fulfill his holy will. My dearly beloved in Christ, though he was the creator of all, Jesus came as a helpless infant in order to condemn our pride. Though he is a king, his throne began in a crib and would end on a cross. Though he owned all, he would be born, live, and die in poverty in order to condemn our avarice and sensuality. But Jesus knew that those reasons would not be able to reach hard hearts. So he also chose to become a helpless little infant in order to draw men to himself. The approach of a little child inspires confidence and warms the heart. My dearly beloved in Christ, this fact presented itself in a true occurrence which took place in Chicago in 1949. Judge Goodnow was a famous arbiter in family law. In 1949, there stood before him a burly, red-headed truck driver who had failed to support his wife and children. The deadbeat dad was unmoved by his wife's tearful tale and the denunciations of the judge. Suddenly, the judge turned to the defendant and firmly commanded him, take that baby. It's too heavy for the mother. The father turned to take the little one. Cooing and kicking, delighted to be noticed by him, the child stretched out its arms. It cuddled up. It patted his cheek and gurgled with joy. In a moment, the father broke down. Every trace of hardness was gone. He burst into tearful words. Judge, let me go back to my babies. I swear, I'll do the right thing. The record shows that he kept his word. The arms and smile and the love of a little child had won the heart of an apparently heartless husband and father. My dear the beloved in Christ, no doubt Almighty God on that first Christmas night had the same thought and the same hope as Judge Goodnow. God hoped that a little child would win sinful men back to the love of God. Every other means might fail, but as with the most 
brutish of men, a child will win the day. So with the most sinful of men, the child will win by love. My dearly beloved in Christ, no matter what your life, no matter what the state of your immortal soul, every single one of you today is charmed and captured by the little one in the manger. That child was promised to the world from the beginning. He had been shown forth in figures in the persons of Abel, Isaac, Moses, and many others. His coming had been exactly foretold by the prophets. And now the angels tell us that he's here. Almighty God has and continues to stand earthquakes, storms, flood, famine, plague, disease, and even death to shake men's souls. But the only thing that would really win men's souls is the love of a little child. Just as Judge Good now realized that when he asked the deadbeat dad to take his little child into his arms, hoping it would melt his heart, so too Almighty God tells each one of us to take the child into our, our arms by letting him enter into our very hearts in Holy Communion. He can change a heart from a source of evil into a source of good and can expand a good heart with greater love and joy. My dearly beloved in Christ, that is the true joy of Christmas, a joy which God in his extreme love makes available to us not only at Christmas, but throughout the entire year, every time we approach the rail in order to receive him in Holy Communion. In closing, do not close the door of your heart by not letting him into your life. Open your hearts. Make a place for him in your life as a number one priority in your life and experience the true and lasting joy of this holy season. Blessed Christmas. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.